Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Wolves in the Woods, Non-Invasive Monitoring Methods, and it will be presented by wildlife biologist, Aaron Bott. Aaron, thank you again for being here today. I look forward to uh, hearing what you have to share with us. Let's just dive in. Thank you, and thank you everyone for tuning in. This is a subject that I decided to present on today because it's kind of a summary of what I did my graduate work on when I was getting a master's degree at Utah State University um, a few years ago. So this is kind of a, a synopsis that I thought would be fun to share. Um, I hope that everyone here can hear me. I wish that we could be face-to-face -face talking and answering questions, but we are fortunate to have this technology to, to help us um, interact with one another. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, by way of introduction, as Sunny announced, I am a wildlife biologist and I specialize in, in wolves, actually. I did my master's work on wolves in Yellowstone National Park. Afterwards, I worked with several agencies and organizations doing wolf research in the Yellowstone area. And I'm currently a doctoral student at Utah State University studying wolves all across the West. Um, but I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different species as well. And yeah, today I'm kind of summarizing what I did uh, a few years ago when I was studying wolves in Yellowstone, working with the Yellowstone Wolf Project. Um, I also worked closely in, with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and the Idaho uh, Department of Fish and Game. I couldn't have completed my master's degree without their help. And uh, I'm also a, a research associate studying large carnivore and human interactions and coexistence with the Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative. Now, in a nutshell, I think it's important that we all remember or are refreshed about the Northern Rocky Mountain Wolf Reintroduction Program that took place in the mid-90s. If you're familiar with this, then I'm just going to briefly go through what happened. If you're not familiar with the Yellowstone wolf reintroduction or the reintroduction of wolves into the lower 48 states that took place out here in the Northern Rockies a couple of decades ago, I have given several webinars with Natural Habitat Adventures on the reintroduction program. So I'm not really going to go into this in great depth today. But as a crash course refresher, uh, in the 1900s, the early 1900s, uh, wolves had been extirpated throughout most of the lower 48 states everywhere, really, except for a small population on the Canada and Minnesota uh, border, right up there in Voyager National Park. And wolves were listed as being regionally extirpated um, on the Endangered Species Act list in 1974. And after a long back and forth battle about where and when we would help wolves recover uh, in the lower 48 states, the rubber finally met the road in 1995 and in 1996. Uh, historically, wolves had a tremendous range all across North America. In fact, Wolves have the greatest terrestrial range of any species on Earth, at least historically, except for that of humans. So once upon a time in the Northern Hemisphere, you could find a wolf just about anywhere. The British Isles, through Scandinavia, through the Siberian, or through Siberia, um, through the Arabian Peninsula, throughout China, etc., even into Northern Africa, and of course, here in, in North America as well. And this map kind of shows an approximate historical range of this species. But like I said, and this is a story for another presentation, one that I've already given, um, wolves were systematically eradicated in the early 1900s and in the late 1800s. Um, but 
because of the restoration efforts that have been taking place the last couple of decades, we've got wolves back in the Northern Rockies, also into the Pacific Northwest. Um, down in the Southwest, we've got reintroduction efforts with the subspecies known as the Mexican gray wolf. And then in the Great Lakes states, we have a robust wolf population. So when the reintroduction took place in the Northern Rocky Mountain states, which is Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, um, and includes Yellowstone National Park, a park that is situated in Northwestern Wyoming primarily, um, 66 wolves were live captured in Canada. And over the course of two years, they were reintroduced into the Northern Rockies. 35 were released into central Idaho, where we have the largest wilderness area in the lower 48 states, the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness, and 31 wolves were released into Yellowstone National Park out of the 66 that were live captured in Canada. Here's a picture of my supervisor, now retired, Doug Smith, um, literally carrying the wolves into Yellowstone National Park. Now it's important that we look at the biology of the species because in order for us to understand how we monitor wolves, especially uh, in today's presentation, which is talking about non-invasive methods, non-invasive meaning uh, how do we, excuse me, how do we monitor the wolves without bothering them as much as possible, um, we have to understand their biology. So commonly these animals are called gray wolves, although gray is a misnomer because here in North America we have wolves ranging from white, the wonderful Arctic wolves that you see in your nature programs are technically gray wolves, just the subspecies, um, all the way to black. And many wolves are more than, I would say, gray, kind of a rusty brown, red, black, white mixture, um, as these wolves are here. Um, this is actually the pack that I did my, my master's degree on. I studied this group um, for many years and we'll talk more about their history in just a minute. Um, but wolves can live up to 12 years, but this data coming from Yellowstone National Park, um, where we've been researching wolves ever, ever since we've reintroduced them in the mid 90s, uh, shows that the average lifespan of a wolf in the park is four to five years. And outside the park where wolf hunting is permitted, um, the average lifespan is even less than that, two to four years this is the average. But even in Yellowstone where they're protected, wolves just live a very violent and dangerous life. Um, they're not super predators, they're pretty pathetic when it comes to hunting actually, compared to mountain lions, for example. And it doesn't take a lot for an injury while chasing an elk or a moose or a buffalo or even a deer to lead to starvation or death. Um, so it, it's just dangerous work being a wolf. And wolves are also highly territorial. They kill one another. Most natural causes of wolf mortality is from wolves killing other wolves. The average size of a wolf is about 100 pounds, males being slightly larger than females. People often think that they're bigger because they have these long legs and in the wintertime their coats, their winter fur coats are, are massive. Um, but I like to think of wolves kind of as the basketball players of the canid family. They have these long legs and these really big feet, um, big even in proportion to the rest of their body. Wolves live in family groups known as packs, which many people already know. Uh, but most of the time, people don't realize that packs are not gangs or mobs of wolves. They are literally family groups. Um, they are a cooperative breeding species, which makes them tantalizing to us because we humans are also living in cooperative breeding groups. Um, we should basically be able to draw many parallels between our lifestyles, our social ecology, with the social ecology of, of wolves. Uh, there's basically a mom and a dad with several generations of offspring, and as the kids grow up, they split. They go look for a mate on their own, their own territory, and try and set up their own comfortable shop where they can raise their own kids. Um, in Yellowstone, the average pack is about 10 wolves, 
outside of Yellowstone that can vary. The packs are relatively large in Yellowstone because there's so much prey that is available for wolves. There's a very abundant population of elk as well as buffalo and more food means more resources for bigger families. Um, wolves reproduce just once a year, domestic dogs, um, where wolves, the wolf is the progenitor to the domestic dog. I gave a presentation about that a couple months ago. Um, they can reproduce two times a year, but wolves reproduce just once a year. In fact, they just whelped last week. They just had their puppies last week after a 63 day gestation period. And pup survival in Yellowstone is between three and four that survive their first year. So generally you have pups that are born in litters of five or six, sometimes even more, but generally between five and six and about half of them survive the first year. And that's just because it's difficult out on that wild landscape to survive. Now, after wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park, a lot of interesting observations were made, not just by the scientific community, but also by the public at large. And I am happy to boast that Yellowstone National Park has one of the most intensive and thorough, thorough uh, wolf research programs in the world. We have learned more in the last 27 years about wolves than we ever knew about wolves in the millennia before that. And that is primarily because of the thorough research that is conducted in Yellowstone. Uh, this picture was taken by a friend, uh, Ronan Donovan, of my supervisor right there, Doug Smith, darting a wolf with a sedative to make the wolf go down so we could capture it and radio color it. And this is primarily what we do in, in Yellowstone. We monitor wolves, uh, very intensively in order to better understand their ecology and their biology. And this kind of work is extremely exciting. Uh, wildlife capture and immobilization for putting radio collars and transmitters on really began actually in the Yellowstone ecosystem in the 1960s. Uh, two brothers, twins actually, John and Frank Craighead, they revolutionized wildlife research. Uh, they essentially invented radio telemetry collars for wildlife and they did a groundbreaking pioneer study on grizzly bears in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And it's because of these Craigheads and their research, their groundbreaking research with invasive radio collars that we began to realize that Yellowstone National Park isn't big enough for wildlife. The wildlife actually uh, move in and out of the park. And it was shortly after their research was published and popularized that the Craigheads began to coin the term Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. So very often today, we, we simplify by just talking about Yellowstone, which is 2.2 million acres. But we now recognize that the entire ecosystem, which is 16 to 20 million acres, depending on who you talk to, um, is really necessary for the park to thrive and for wildlife to thrive. Uh, we need more land than we thought originally. And this is all possible, again, because of the invasive research of radio coloring. And here we are decades later, and we are still using the same research tools. Uh, we still have collars that we put out, VHF collars, which are based off of a, a simple uh, radio telemetry signal, which we can triangulate and figure out where animals are. Or we have GPS collars, um, which are more expensive, but can give us the literal movement of wildlife across the landscape from the comfort of our computers. And this information is, is precious because it helps us to understand the overall ecology of a species, something that we were never able to do before we started putting out invasive radio collars. Um, this is kind of the, the population trend of Yellowstone's wolf wolves uh, after they were reintroduced, but uh, within the park at any given time of year, you basically have 100 wolves, which is a, the carrying capacity of the park. 
wolves of course are dying and they're being born and wolves are uh, immigrating and they're emigrating. So wolves are constantly shifting on the landscape and outside of Yellowstone, the wolf population is very large. Um, but within Yellowstone National Park, again, because of our intensive monitoring, we've been able to keep a pretty steady pin on how many wolves are out there. And I should have put up a more recent population map, but this goes all the way to 2021. And again, these collars, these invasive collars help us understand how animals move on the landscape. They give us a snippet of their entire life history and wolves can boogie. They really can move across the landscape in ways that are truly surprising. I get phone calls of people who think there are more wolves on the landscape than there actually are. And I pull up the GPS information on my computer and I can see that wolves are, are moving 30 to 40 miles in a day. And sometimes people are seeing the same wolf in different areas and it's, it's shocking to people to see how far they can actually wiggle. Um, but yeah, this is a, a map of radio collared wolves, um, specifically wolf uh, 1012. He was a male that died in 2026 or 2016, excuse me. And this shows his, his pack movements, his spatial movements in the winter and in the summer. Now, if you're paying attention, you might notice, might have noticed that I keep talking about invasive collars. And today's presentation is supposed to be about non-invasive research. And that's true. In fact, the parody kind of is that my introductory slide showed me radio collaring some wolves, which is very invasive. Invasive means that you have to disturb the animal in order to extract the data. And my point in talking about invasive methods of research is to show just how valuable they are, especially when we want to know how animals move on the landscape, when we want to understand their reproduction, when we want to know what habitat is most needed for their protection, for the conservation of the species. Invasive methods of research really have their place. And unfortunately, until we get better methods of non-invasive research, we're gonna to continue to depend upon radio collaring in order to understand um, how wildlife uh, continues to live and utilize the natural landscape. And uh, this right here shows Yellowstone Pack Range. This is a couple years old, but it basically shows where the wolves in Yellowstone are based off of their packs. And you can see that the majority of the packs are concentrated in northern Yellowstone, but that shaded blue corner uh, in the bottom left-hand part of the map is a mystery. And this is where my graduate research comes into play. So we know that we have wolves in other parts of Yellowstone. They're just not collared. So how do we manage, how do we conserve, how do we monitor wolves not just in Yellowstone, but anywhere in the world where we don't have radio collars? How do we study wildlife if we can't get invasive uh, research uh, methods deployed? Well, that was the question. And to kind of reflect, let me back up really quick. Again, showing you the, the concentration of wolves in the northern part of Yellowstone. Most people don't realize even the ones that have visited Yellowstone, that uh, the majority of Yellowstone is a big desert. Uh, this right here is the Northern Range, known as Lamar Valley. It's prime wildlife habitat. But in 1872, when Yellowstone was first created as a national park, it wasn't intended to be a wildlife preserve. It was created as a national park to preserve the geologic oddities, such as the geyser basins. People weren't thinking about wildlife when the park was created. It wasn't really until the mid 90 or the mid uh, 20th century that we began to recognize that Yellowstone was a haven for wildlife. But mostly the wildlife live in the Northern Range, which is only about 10% of Yellowstone's 2.2 million acres. This is where you have the highest concentration of wolves. And this is why if you go on a net have trip, this is where you're gonna spend a lot of time looking at wildlife because this is where the wildlife is at. This is 
of Yellowstone National Park, a huge coniferous desert where primarily we have lodgepole pine trees that grow in the uh, not very nutritious rhyolitic soils of the Yellowstone volcanic plateau. And because there's not a lot to eat, you don't have a lot of wildlife. Nevertheless, we do have some wolves because we get them reported or even seen occasionally. Or occasionally, a collared wolf will move through this large forest. And so the big question that was generated by the National Park Service and then later I adopted was, are there wolves? Are they being persistent on the landscape? And how are they behaving? What is their reproduction? So these are my questions. I don't know if the video is working very well on your end, but uh, we wanted to answer three very basic questions, the kind of the questions that summarize all um, wildlife research questions in the beginning, which is what is the range of the species? Uh, what are they eating? And how are they reproducing? Or, or how effectively are they reproducing? What is the recruitment of their population? So I um, grew up just outside of Yellowstone National Park, two miles from the Yellowstone border, five miles from the Grand Teton border, where my family has lived for many generations. And I was very familiar with the backcountry. Um, I got my first job working in the Yellowstone backcountry as an outfitter when I was 14. And I had worked there for, uh, I don't even know, probably 14 years before I went to uh, grad school to get my master's degree. I knew the biologists and I approached them and said, hey, I need a, a research project. Can I study wolves in the park's interior, um, particularly the Southwest interior? And they said, sure, but you know, it's all gonna have to be non-invasive. And to put things into perspective, this really remote area of Yellowstone National Park is is marvelous. It's often referred to or nicknamed as Cascade Corner because it comes off of the Pitchstone and the Madison Plateaus, which are high in elevation, and it gets eight times as much precipitation as the rest of Yellowstone or the northern portion of Yellowstone National Park. So a lot of snow, which kind of keeps this place a mystery. And then when the snow melts, um, everything floods and becomes a huge marsh. I didn't show pictures of the mosquitoes, but they're as big as eagles. Not really, but they're they're pretty huge. Um, it's a, a very marshy, atypical landscape when you think of the Yellowstone ecosystem. But we have tons of waterfalls, dozens and dozens of waterfalls all over this landscape. And it's all back country, it's all remote. There's no front country, meaning you don't have roads to access any of it. It's where I grew up and it's pretty beautiful. Um, so over the next several years while studying wolves in this area, I had to get a wiggle on, as my wife would say. I had to track wolves primarily on foot. And this map shows all of the trails that I went on, at least within this frame of the map. Um, I covered, I believe it was uh, 1,500 miles in three years. Uh, again, almost all on foot, hiking primarily uh, by myself or with a friend or another biologist. Um, but I also had access to the backcountry in other ways. I traveled occasionally by snowshoe or ski, uh, on horseback or on snowmobile. Um, that is actually not a river that I'm crossing in the bottom right hand corner. That's just the marshes. It shows you how much they flood in the springtime. Um, but all of this is trying to figure out where wolves are on the landscape. And the best way you do this is through tracking. And tracking is a skill set, a very primitive skill set, which is highly effective today in wildlife biology. In fact, yesterday, I was out in the field from dawn till dusk tracking wolves. Um, it's a skill set that sometimes you have to have patience in order to develop. It's a lot like reading. In fact, there's a wonderful quote I'll show later about how um, tracking is really the first language, the first written language that uh, ever existed. And our ability to, to read tracks and understand tracks help us even today to get a better grasp on on any species of wildlife on the landscape. And tracking wolves is very fun. It's thrilling and exciting because 
a wolf track is huge, disproportionately large, even to a large animal like a wolf. Um, you can see the wolf tracks here. You can also see horse horseshoe tracks um, in the snow, kind of giving you an idea of just how large they are. Generally, a wolf track is four to five inches, um, typically closer to five inches, but occasionally even up to six inches long. So it's a big animal. The last C part of tracking is collecting scat samples. Scat can tell us a lot about uh, an animal's diet. You can look and see what it's been consuming um, based off of its look. You can uh, also determine how fresh it is. You can determine what it was eating. If you get kind of stringy, soupy stuff like on the left, even more so actually when it's black and tarish, that means that the animal has been feeding on a fresh kill and is eating the rich organs inside the chest cavity. Um, and as the scat is older, it collects more hair and more bone. Um, also, you can determine how old it is, not just how hard it is, but based off of oxidization. Um, not only that, but we can collect these scats and then we ship them to a laboratory where we then use uh, genetic research to determine the pedigree of the animal from whence the scat came. When an animal defecates or a human defecates, um, some of the internal lining of the intestines is sloughed off and we can get a good DNA sample just from collecting scat. Um, we also are able to figure out some of the answers to the reproductive questions. So we can figure out uh, the range by tracking. It gives us a pretty good idea of, of where wolves are frequently uh, habitating areas in the backcountry. We can figure out what their foraging is and then also their reproduction because the tracks can lead us to dens. These are two different wolf den sites. Um, and they also can tell us pretty interesting stories. Um, wolves howl, that's kind of a, a dead giveaway to finding where wolves are. And also in the springtime slash summertime, depending on when they reproduced, uh, you can do uh, howling surveys and you can identify who is in the group based off of age by listening to the howls and so that's a pretty good way of uh, uh, it's a pretty good indicator of finding out if your wolf group has whelped if they've had pups um, also interestingly here we had um, the, the ability to document interspecific conflicts with other predators on the landscapes. So animals don't live in harmony with one another. Very often they're in conflict. Um, other predators on the landscape, such as coyotes, even foxes, black bears, grizzly bears, mountain lions, they're all kind of wary of one another. They're always looking over their shoulder because uh, conflicts do happen. In fact, uh, the first year we were documenting a black bear that raided a wolf den and killed all of the pups inside. And because of that, the wolf pack had to relocate the following year. Typically, they'll use the same dens year after year. And these questions about interspecific conflicts with other predators on the landscape really was provocative. And so I began to work with Idaho Fish and Game specifically in capturing and collaring grizzly bears as a part of the interagency grizzly bear research team efforts to monitor the reproduction and the population status of grizzlies because they're still listed as a threatened species in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And we wanted to know where they were moving on the landscape and how frequently they were perhaps uh, interacting with wolves. And more often than not, in my neck of the woods, we found out that wolves and black bears were getting into into tangles. Um, this is a remarkable picture taken from a trail camera of a wolf in my area tangling with a black bear. And we were actually able to track wolves going over to nest to denning bears. And it's an area of research that I think is underappreciated, the conflicts between wolves and black bears. In Northern Yellowstone, a lot of research has gone into kleptoparasitism, which is the study of um, predators stealing or taking advantage of kills made by a different species. And grizzly bears are the, the big bully at the top of the food chain. They scare away wolves and they scare away mountain lions. 
And those poor mountain lions, they are the most effective predators, but they are often chased away by both wolves and bears on the landscape. And then of course we have wolves killing wolves. There are other packs, as I mentioned, they're extremely territorial and wolves often kill wolves. And we were able to document, as in this upper right hand corner, um, intra specific conflicts where other wolf packs came in and, and would cause mortality and that would obviously affect the population. Um, studying all this, you know, you get into to doing necropsies. Necropsies is studying uh, or investigating uh, dead animals to try and determine how old they are, what was the cause of death, uh, what body condition the animal was in when they died. Generally, when you're looking at a skull, you're, you're looking at tooth wear, dentition wear. Um, also, whenever we get a chance, we if we find a dead wolf, we try and harvest some of the, the flesh for more DNA research. So we'll take samples of the tongue or of the foot pad, or in some cases, we'll just sever the whole head and send it into the laboratory for, for analysis in order to better comprehend uh, the life history of that animal before it was deceased, before it, it died. Um, we also did necropsies based off of uh, foraging habits. So wolves primarily kill elk in the Yellowstone ecosystem. They're the most abundant prey resource and they're kind of the ideal package when it comes to hunting for, for wolves. And we can look at you know, the body condition of these animals up until the time that they died as well as sexing the animals. Um, we we're also able to document other things like uh, beavers and wolf consumption of beavers particularly in this area was very high. Wolves are the number one predator for beavers in any area that the two species overlap. But here in this area where there's very few elk and no bison, um, wolves were eating uh, very diverse things such as sandhill cranes and beavers and a lot of white-tailed deer and some mule deer, etc. And even an otter or two. And again, we do necropsies and look at the marrow condition in order to determine the overall body condition. When an animal dies or when a human dies, the fat reserves in the marrow are the last thing to go. So if the marrow is off-colored or it's gelatinous or mucousy, um, that tells us that the animal is in extremely poor body condition when it died. Uh, that's a wolf femur in the upper left-hand corner, and that's an elk femur in the big picture on the right. And again, yeah, we, we harvest the heads and send them to the laboratory for analysis. So all of this is done remotely. We're not really getting in the face of the wolves too much. Of course, they're aware of our presence, no doubt. I was there for multiple years and I'm sure they became familiar with my scent, but primarily I'm, I'm bushwhacking and it's, I'm trying to disturb them as little as possible. Um, remote tracking technology is also very useful. Um, radio, or excuse me, um, remote cameras are a game changer. Without remote cameras, we wouldn't be able to get visuals on the wolves that we're studying. And these cameras are truly impressive in their abilities to help us understand how many wolves are in the pack, what they're doing, what the behavior is, and they can answer specific questions, such as how many pups were born, if you're lucky enough to find the den site and put a camera up on it. Um, this camera in my photograph here was actually smashed by a black bear because some animals like to break the cameras um, unfortunately. But we also have uh, other technologies that are on the rise such as audio moss. These are really cool things which I hope to start using within the next month or so. I haven't had any experience with them but um, these audio detection devices can be put out in the field and they can detect howling um, and they can help you uh, monitor areas where wolves are occupying. Um, you can't get as good of information as from say a, a tracking or a remote camera because you don't get the visual but if you're unsure of wolves in an area in a certain vicinity uh, this this audio moth is extremely helpful and beneficial for non-invasively studying wildlife. Our methods for studying animals non-invasively are getting better and better. Invasive research such as trapping and radio collaring are not going away anytime soon because they just give us so much information that is precious as we're trying to 
to conserve as much habitat for these animals as possible. Um, but the technology for non-invasive stuff is quickly gaining a lot of speed. Uh, invasive research gives us good information, but it's potentially dangerous for the animals. It's potentially dangerous for the people. Um, flying around in a helicopter is extremely dangerous. And the number one cause of deaths for wildlife biologists is plane crashes and helicopter crashes. Um, animals uh, sometimes die in, in invasive capturing efforts. Um, it's extremely expensive, the helicopters and the planes, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, it's what we're using because it's what we have. But as our technology progresses, I think we're gonna, we'll be seeing more and more uh, less invasive and more sustainable methods of non-invasively monitoring wildlife. Uh, sustainable, I say that because, for example, as the wolf population grows throughout the West, uh, it's tough to keep tabs on how many wolves are in the landscape. You can't realistically capture wolves and put collars on every, uh, at least an individual from every pack. And so in order to monitor the population and its viability, uh, we have to figure out more sustainable ways of determining where wolves are on the landscape. But I like to conclude by using this quote here from one of my favorite books. I highly recommend it, um, The Tiger by John Valiant. I might be mispronouncing his last name, but in it, he's talking about um, one of the characters in his book in, in the taiga in Siberia when they're tracking tigers. And he's talking about the importance of, of tracking and how old the skill set is. And the quote is, the first letter of the first word of the first recorded story was written not by us, but by an animal. I think how wonderfully true that is. I get goosebumps when I'm out in the field and I'm tracking wolves or moose or grizzly bears. And I, I get to um, get a snippet of this primeval uh, skill set that, that is still relevant today in our natural world as we try and continue to, to monitor and protect wildlife. And with that, I will conclude the webinar and take questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. That's fascinating. And um, we've got lots of questions. Um, first one is, are you familiar with or have you worked with the Wolf Center in Ely, Minnesota? And can you say anything about that? Yeah, um, the I am the International Wolf Center in Ely, Minnesota. I am very familiar with them. In fact, once upon a time, I almost worked for them. I think very highly of them. It was established by Dr. David Nietzsche, who's kind of the, the godfather of wolf research, if you will. It's very accredited. And yeah, I've never been there, actually. I've never visited, but I almost worked there once upon a time. <laughs> um do you know what has happened to um, the wolves or what have happened to the wolves that were introduced into Idaho during the reintroduction? Yep, they're doing great. So Idaho has a population of probably 1,000 to 1,500 wolves in the state today. And Montana has a population of about 1,100 wolves in the state today. And Wyoming, which has fewer habitat re or options for wolves has a population of about 300 wolves and these you know 2,000 to 3,000 wolves that we have in the northern Rockies and in the Pacific Northwest um, Washington and Oregon they all came from the 66 wolves that were reintroduced the 66 wolves and some wolves that have been trickling down from from Canada since then so this is also, despite very aggressive, perhaps even draconian, uh, efforts to trap and hunt wolves. So wolves are very resilient in the face of human persecution. So even though um, there's a lot of aggressive hunting and trapping in Idaho and in Montana, um, the population is still very large. Mm. So when a wolf kills another wolf, 
what does it do with the body? Anything? Does it eat it? Does it just discard it? It typically discards it. Cannibalism is very rarely documented. Wolves are territorial and violent towards one another because they're protecting resources. So they are not killing other wolves to eat them just to protect their own resources. So that picture of a carcass I showed had been scavenged on primarily by birds, by buzzards and eagles, but wolves don't don't eat other wolves usually. Got it. What's the most common cause um, for wolf pups not to survive? Um, that's difficult to say. It's probably related to food. Um, it could be that they starve. It could be disease. In some years, we have outbreaks of parvovirus or canine distemper especially canine distemper, which is related to measles. Um, it causes high uh, mortality in pups. Um, so mm -hmm. disease, food, um, they're young and dumb too. They, they sometimes unfortunately just get themselves hurt hunting or are hunted by people or are killed by other, by other wolves. Again, that photograph of the wolf that I showed you that had been killed by other wolves that was technically a pup of the year that that wolf was less than a year old um, it was a teenager you could say got it um, noticing that the Yellowstone population is down from the peak around 2000 is there a reason for that that you're aware of and is it a cause for concern it is not a cause for concern. It is because the elk population has stabilized at a lower at a lower level than when wolves were first reintroduced. So wolves and elk have this interesting dynamic relationship on the landscape. There were a lot of elk when wolves were reintroduced. And as the elk population came down, eventually the carrying capacity of the wolves came down as well. So the fewer elk reflects fewer wolves on the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so regarding relocation of wolves, given the conflict between packs, do you just lift an entire pack and relocate it? And do you relocate different packs in different locations to minimize conflict? So relocation of wolves doesn't work very well. Um, unfortunately, relocation of most wildlife doesn't work very well uh, because of what we call capture and relocation myopathy, which is stress. So the animal stressed and it could die, or it gets if it's like a bear, for example, where it's it's being relocated because it caused problems with people. If you move it, there's nowhere that you can move it where it's not going to bump into people again. Um, this is something I try and talk a lot about as a wildlife biologist because it's a sad reality that I think people need to understand. The most remote area in the entire lower 48 states is the thoroughfare of Yellowstone National Park. It's 20 miles from a road. 20 miles is all. You could hike 20 miles in a day. So if you dropped off a bear in the most remote place in the lower 48 states, in 24, 48 hours, it's going to be back where humans are again, and it could cause problems. So wolves, because they are territorial, and if they're causing problems, it's just very difficult to relocate them, which is why the undertaking in the 1990s to, to reintroduce wolves was so remarkable. Um, we tried very hard to capture entire pack groups so that we weren't just alienating wolves and hoping that it all worked together. Um, in one case, mm. they did all, they were all strangers, but it worked out remarkably. Um, and I think the reason why that worked is because we put them in a, a pen together during breeding season. And so they were able to redefine themselves as a new pack. Yeah, most of the time we don't relocate wolves because of, it just wouldn't work. Individual right. wolves, I should clarify. We don't okay. get individual wolves. 
Okay. Um, the question is, how about using drones? Would that be invasive, considered invasive? Would that work? I am optimistic. I have only used drones doing bison surveys and that didn't work very well they the bison detected it i mean these aren't yellowstone bison that i was surveying so they're they're not the ones that are walking on the road and up to your vehicle they're wild bison that are they were very skittish and they just were super paranoid with the drone um but i'm still optimistic like with bears and with wolves and with other species of wildlife, I think that that drones would work. I know that there's a lot of growing attention in the wildlife biology circle of using drones. I haven't had a lot of experience with it, uh, specifically on marine mammals. Uh, marine mammals are very frequently being researched with the use of drones and thermal heat imagery and stuff like that. So. Yes, I think that there's a lot of potential there, and I hope that I hope that we start to embrace some of that. Hmm. Um, new information has come out um, about the alpha um, hypothesis not being entirely true. Um, are you familiar with that new way of thinking, and what sort of technology and methods gave us? that new information. Yes, I am familiar with that. So wolves were misunderstood and are, <laughs> but they were misunderstood for a very long time, even by the scientific community. So really up until the 1990s, I would be so bold as to say, um, most of our observations and research of wolves was non-invasive, indirect, tracking and studying, but never actually observing wolves, except for wolves in captivity. And wolves in captivity have a different social dynamic than in reality, in nature, very often. Um, we assumed for a long time, because of our study of captive wolves and because of our observations with domestic dogs, that there was a hierarchy where one individual would exert itself as an alpha and the rest would fall into line. Then as we began to improve our, our field observations, especially in Yellowstone National Park, we began to realize that the alpha hypothesis was false, that wolves actually live in nuclear family groups where a male and a female have offspring. And the offspring and the parents make up the pack. Now that's pretty simplistic. Sometimes there are some nuances. Um, packs will adopt other wolves occasionally, sometimes grandma or grandpa's in the pack. But yeah, as biologists, we avoid the term alpha because alpha defines a personality characteristic and not all alphas are breeders and not all breeders are alphas, vice versa. So it's it's literally just, um, as scientists, we say dominant breeders. So a dominant breeding male, a dominant breeding female, and their offspring. We avoid the word alpha. Hmm. Okay. Um, do you have any news about the um, wolves that were introduced or reintroduced to Colorado and or New York? How are those packs doing? So wolves have not yet been reintroduced into Colorado. Wolves are going to be reintroduced into Colorado this year. However, coincidentally, a wolf pack from Wyoming naturally migrated down to Northern Colorado and has been residing there for the last two years, maybe three years this, this spring. Um, and that pack is still hanging around. Um, but reintroduction, where humans are going to go in and capture wolf wolf groups, they are going to wolf packs. They're going to be uh, hitting the ground later this year, probably November and December. Um, that project is mm -hmm. underway, and it's the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Program that is responsible for that. 
there have been no other reintroductions of wolves in the United States. So occasionally we document wolves that will move great distances, including some coyote wolf hybrids that have made their way over into New York, but there is not, uh, there have not been any reintroductions there except for the Mexican gray wolf, which was reintroduced into Arizona and New Mexico in 1998. And that's just the subspecies of the gray wolf. In fact, I am a person who would argue that they're just wolves, just the gray wolf. So okay. that's how that is going. So thanks for clarifying that. Um, you'd mentioned there were 66 wolves at one point. Were they all genetically similar? Was there much diversity? And then how has that affected the population at this point? Good question. So the first year we captured wolves in Alberta, the second year we captured wolves in British Columbia because we wanted genetic diversity. And what's really cool is because we handled all 66 wolves, we have almost a complete pedigree of, of any wolf in the Northern Rockies. If you really wanted to, you could go out and capture a wolf and take a blood sample or, you know, collect scat and, and uh, you could do basically a, a pedigree chart. You could determine where that wolf came from uh, 27 years ago. And wolves are extremely dynamic. Other wolves have since migrated down through northwestern Montana and Idaho and Washington into the existing wolf population that we have, and there is no concern for genetic bottlenecking. The wolf population has really healthy, a really healthy and diverse gene pool. Hmm. Um, are wolves vaccinated when they're collared? No, no, they're not. We. Let nature take its course with just about everything. So we, if there's a superficial wound, then we try and flush it out, or we might um, give it some sutures. Um, you know, if there's, uh, yeah, if there's like something, let's see, like last summer, there was a grizzly bear, for example, that had been in a fight with another grizzly bear, and we sutured it up. Or with, with wolves, we we try and dress them up. We give them some. Um, yeah, we, we clean them up as much as possible, but we do not vaccinate them. We do not, um, we, we try and let nature take its course. Hmm. Well, Wolves thank you again, Aaron. That was a fascinating discussion. I'm gonna turn it back to you for closing comments. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Um, I, I was just gonna say that wolves, when we did reintroduce them in the 90s, those wolves were vaccinated. So when they were brought down from Canada, we did vaccinate them and test them for diseases. But thanks everyone for tuning in. I appreciate the Q&A. That's my favorite part of, of this whole thing. So uh, I was happy to hopefully introduce you into the world of studying and monitoring wolves. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you. And I also want to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again next week for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, at our website, nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone.